Testing. Check one, two, check one, two.
Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, hopefully last meeting before the summer break of the Built Heritage uh, Subcommittee. And it's a busy one today. Um, so, confirmation of minutes, the minutes from 8th of May. Carrie? Hang on, I don't see well enough today for some reason to see that far. You know why? Because I don't need them for far, <laughs> but I need them for here. <laughs> Any declarations of interest? None? Communications, we have the... Um, yes, I do. Sorry. You have a conflict of interest? Okay, so we have a declaration of interest on the Brantwood Gates from uh, Vice Chair Podolsky. So on the uh, on item number one, we're going to hold that, but the applicant is here and it does want to just speak to us briefly. Item number two, application to alter 429 McLaren Street, a property designated under Part 5 of the Ontario Heritage Act and located in the Centertown Heritage Conservation District. This one's coming back to us. We dealt with it last year, and, uh, and so there's some changes. Is that carried? Yes. Carried. Item number three, we have a presentation. So we'll hold that. Item number four, the application to alter the Brantwood Gates. Any? We have no delegations on, uh, on this uh, item. Does anyone want to hold it? Is it carried? Oh, the declaration. You have to back up, please. Back up. Step away from the desk. Thank you. We note that uh, Vice Chair Podolsky has left the building momentarily. Um, is the rest of the committee ready to uh, carry that? Okay. Carry. Welcome back, Vice Chair Podolsky. And item number five, we have delegations and we have a presentation, so we'll hold that. So the first thing I'd like to recommend is that uh, we deal with item number one, but then if you uh, all agree, the members of the committee, I'd like to go to number five because we have delegations there, and then finish up with the uh, uh, horticultural building. Agreed? Okay. So item number one is the application to alter 455 Green Avenue, a property designator of Part 5 of the Ontario Heritage Act located in the Rockcliffe Park Heritage Conservation District. Where did my... Where's my... Do I have it? Hang on, everybody. What did I do with the sheet? Okay. I have, we have misplaced the sheet that you signed in, so please come forward. Rakan Abishar. Welcome. Just uh, sit in that first seat and press the, uh, the button. Thank you. And thank you very much for your application, uh, your uh, letter that uh, we received uh, that recommending that or asking us to accept your withdrawal at this time. Go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Ms. Collins and the members of the committee for taking the time to uh, review our application. Um, based on the report that we received and uh, based on the uh, comments and recommendations from Heritage uh, Ottawa and the uh, Rockcliffe Park uh, Committee, as well as the Cultural Heritage Impact Statement prepared by uh, architect Robert Martin, uh, we have decided to withdraw the application and uh, go back to redesign the project <coughs> in a manner that will address these comments and remarks. Um, our target is to uh, submit um, a redesign by July 10th, at, during which time we'll be working very closely with these uh, members to, uh, to achieve a design that is more in line with the recommendations. I wanted just to highlight that we have arrived at, that impa at this impasse with the design, not due to lack of effort and uh, 
accepting the recommendations that were put through uh, in our discussions. However, we tried, I guess, overly hard to take on board the, the various comments um, um, and subjective opinions of too many, uh, I guess, uh, parties and ended up with a, an overly complex design. So hopefully with the next round of redesign, we look to go back to the basics and address all, <coughs> all the comments. So thank you for your time again. Thank you. Anyone have any questions, Sandy? Well, I just wanted to say on behalf of the committee, on behalf of staff, um, at Heritage Ottawa, I'm going to speak for you uh, and, and the community. We really appreciate that. Is, you know, the best, the best result, resolve can all, always be when the applicant says, we've listened. Uh, we've listened to, in this case, the, uh, the, um, the planner, the, uh, the community, uh, Heritage Ottawa, and, um, we're going to go back and see what we can do with those recommendations. I thank you very much for that. So thank, thank you. you, and we look forward to seeing the application come back. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that uh, first item uh, is withdrawn. So now we're going to go uh, directly to uh, Prospect Road, and we're going to have Old Prospect. We have some speakers, as I said, but we do have a presentation from staff. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, the application before you today is an application for demolition and new construction at 565 and 575 Old Prospect Road, uh, located in the Rockcliffe Park Heritage Conservation District. The property is located at the corner of Old Prospect Road and Lansdowne Road North. Um, in, in the Rockcliffe Park Heritage District, it currently has a single detached dwelling on the site. This is uh, an image showing the existing building. It uh, does not face either onto Old Prospect Road or Lansdowne Road. In fact, it has its own sort of driveway off of Prospect Road that it faces onto. So it's, it's a sort of strange situation. However, you can see that the uh, site does have significant mature landscape features, including a large hedge and uh, a number of mature trees. This is an image of the property. The property is located on the right of this photo. Um, this is looking along Lansdowne Road. The uh, left-hand side of the photo <coughs> is the Hart Massey House at 456 Lansdowne Road and, uh, it, it, and Mackay Lake behind. The property is designated under Part 5 of the Ontario Heritage Act and located in the Rockcliffe Park Heritage District, and that is why uh, the application is before you today, um, because there is a proposal to demolish the existing building and construct uh, two new dwellings um, in the Heritage Conservation District, and this requires the approval of City Council after consultation with the Built Heritage Subcommittee. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the application includes the demolition of the existing building on the site, um, the severance of the site into two parcels, construction of two single detached dwellings on the two new parcels. Uh, the project does require other planning applications as well in order, in order to have a building permit issued. Uh, it is somewhat complex because the severance of the site uh, could potentially have an impact on the Heritage Conservation District, so I have addressed that in my report as well. But the decision on the severance of the site and the minor variances would be from the Committee of Adjustment. This is the site plan for the proposed site. Um, I understand uh, 
This is not the one that was included in the report. That was an error. So I think this has been circulated to all members of the committee. The only change from this site plan to the one that was in the report is the removal of the semicircular driveway on Old Prospect Road, which was located um, it was located right here, and it has been determined that through the, it did not comply with the private approach bylaw and would not have been permitted, so we ask for it to be removed from the drawings. Um, as you can see, the lot is severed in two. You can see this dotted line here is the outline of the existing building on the lot. So the existing building is sort of right in the middle of the lot. Um, the property is surrounded by a mature cedar hedge, which you will have seen some comments about um, from the community, and a number of mature trees. The proposed um, houses on the lot are uh, one house that uh, has its driveway from Lansdowne Road um, and a walkway from, from Old Prospect Road, and then the second house, which ha uh, has its driveway from Old Prospect Road um, and uh, addresses that street. Part of the plan includes uh, introducing uh, a cedar hedge to divide the properties, uh, which is typical in, in Rockcliffe Park and is consistent with the character of the landscape. So this is uh, what's being called House A, or 565 Old Prospect Road. Um, oh. It is 565, the drawing is incorrect. Um, so the... Uh, this is the proposed house for the, uh, the lot that's not at the corner. Uh, it's a two and a half story house with a hipped roof, uh, a two story projecting bay at the front. It would be clad in wood shingles and buff colored brick, and it has a flat roofed uh, garage um, facing the street. This is the rear elevation and the side uh, east elevation of the building. This is the house B, which is significantly more contemporary in nature. It uh, has two stories with a flat roof and a partial third story, um, which also has a flat roof and leads to a rooftop terrace. Um, its garage, which you will see in the next slide, is uh, located below grade um, off of Lansdowne Road. Uh, so this is the garage here. Um, the building is proposed to be clad in stone and wood and uh, has significant panels of, uh, of glazing. This just shows you a streetscape view with the buildings included um, in the streetscape. So this is uh, looking at Old Prospect Road. Obviously, as these are renderings, they are meant for illustration purposes only and not part of the approval. Um, however, this is the house at 575, the more contemporary building that I was referring to, and then this is the house at 565, um, the proposed house. And then here you see the elevation along Lansdowne Road, so you can see this uh, below grade garage that is proposed uh, on Lansdowne Road. Again, um, renderings of the proposed buildings. As you can see, one is, is more traditional in nature and the other is, is more contemporary um, in nature both, both buildings reflect the eclectic mix of styles in Rockcliffe Park. So the recommendation before the committee today is to approve the application to demolish, approve the applications for new construction, issue the heritage permit with a two-year expiry date, and delegate authority for minor design changes to the Planning and Growth Management Department. Um, I'll now go through the Heritage Conservation District guidelines to uh, illustrate how we, we arrived at that recommendation to approval. Um, there are three sections of the guidelines that are applicable in this instance. Um, the section on buildings, the section on lot division, and the section on landscape. So in relation to buildings, the guideline for demolition is that demolition should only be approved where the building is not um, of any significance to the uh, Heritage Conservation District and where the new building is appropriate. And then secondly, that new buildings should be of their own time, but should harmonize with the cultural landscape and the use of natural materials is encouraged. Excuse me. Um, the existing building was constructed in 1956, and in the recent um, evaluation of all of the buildings in the Rockcliffe Park Heritage Conservation District, it was assigned little significance in the context of the HCD. Um, therefore, the proposed, de that the proposed demolition meets that first criteria of uh, should only be approved where the building has little significance. 
Um, and the new buildings are considered to be appropriate because they are of their own time and through the use of natural materials and their eclectic styles are compatible with the character of the Heritage Conservation District and of the street. In relation to lot division, and uh, as I said at the beginning, this is where things get a little bit um, confusing in terms of uh, jurisdiction. As I said, the Committee of Adjustment would have jurisdiction over the approval of the severance. Um, as that is under the Planning Act. However, there, there are guidelines within the Heritage Conservation District study that refer to lot division and the patterns of lot division. So we have assessed the proposal against those guidelines. Um, the first is that the existing pattern of lot division should be protected with its wide range of sizes and shapes. Um, the retention of existing larger lots should be encouraged, especially where there is a significant building. And that lots should provide generous open space around the buildings. So obviously, um, this, is, this is proposing that not the retention of an existing larger lot. However, uh, there, there is no significant building on this site. And the proposed lots, um, in our opinion, provide enough open space around the buildings and retain the significant landscape features on the properties um, to, to be compatible with the character of the lots in Rockcliffe Park. Um, they are similar in size to other lots in the Heritage District and, uh, and do not result in the loss of any significant landscape features. The third, guideline, third set of guidelines are about soft and hard landscape. And the um, guidelines in summary state that there should be a dominance of soft landscape over hard and that new buildings should be designed and cited to protect and enhance significant qualities of the existing landscape. Uh, and as I just mentioned, the existing mature landscaping will be retained, uh, including the, the uh, mature cedar hedge, which is characteristic of Rockcliffe Park. I understand there are some concerns with safety around the hedge, um, and, and that could be explored through trimming or, or cutting it back a bit. Um, and a new cedar hedge uh, will be planted between the two properties to delineate the property line. New hard landscaping uh, includes uh, one driveway for each property and a walkway uh, along Old Prospect Road for the building at 575. We also review the standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada. Um, the two relevant standards here are conserve the value of the historic place. So in this instance, the historic place is the the Heritage Conservation District of Rockcliffe Park, and it is our assessment that the proposal does conserve that heritage value and does not in negatively impact the character of this landscape or streetscape. And when creating new additions, you conserve the heritage value um, of the historic place. And in this instance, the use of materials, um, the height, massing, and setback of both new buildings make them vi visually and physically compatible with the architectural character of Rockcliffe Park. A cultural heritage impact statement was prepared as part of this uh, application and uh, it has been included as an attachment to the report. But in summary, it evaluated the impacts from the, uh, the potential impacts resulting from the demolition, the new construction, the landscape alterations and the severance. Uh, its conclusion was that it found no serious uh, negative impacts on the value of the HCD. And it uh, states as its conclusion, as a quote, um, the new buildings can exist comfortably in their surroundings without negatively impacting the character of the Heritage Conservation District. In terms of consultation, neighbors within 30 meters of the property were notified of the, of the application and offered the opportunity to comment, and I understand the committee has received a number of comments, and I believe there are some uh, delegations here to speak today. The Rockcliffe Park Residents Association was also notified of the application, and they have submitted comments that are not in support of it. And Council Clark was also um, notified of the application and has expressed uh, concerns with the proposal. So in conclusion, the department supports the applications for demolition and new construction because the proposed buildings are appropriate and the pres preservation of uh, significant landscape features is in keeping with the guidelines. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Well, I have more than concerns. The Committee of Adjustment hasn't dealt with the severance issue. The severance issue is in opposition to the, the heritage guidelines. Uh, clearly, it should be dealt with by Committee of Adjustment before we start considering design issues. Uh, lots of problems with the design as well, but that's another day, and hopefully. 
And uh, no, I cannot support this, and I believe that that it violates the HCD agreement. And it also, because they started out with, quote, a placeholder, no design, and all of a sudden the design hasn't been through the Dev design review subcommittee of the region of the Rockcliffe Park RA. And, you know, somehow or other we're putting the cart before the horse. I don't believe we should be considering this at all today, but I certainly don't believe we should support it. Uh, it does not meet the Heritage District guidelines or the Rockcliffe Park Association's interpretation of them. It does, you know, the lot sizes are both going to be below the minimums that currently exist in the HCD, and according to that, we should uh, should reject it unless the City Committee of Adjustment says we should consider it. So, uh, just from my point of view, we've jumped out ahead of this thing and decided to consider it before it's even uh, looked at by the Committee of Adjustment. C C Council Clark? Yes? Can I just ask you something? That this is normally when we have um, questions, not wrap up. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll wrap it up again, okay. I mean, is we do have a fair number of speakers that uh, would like the opportunity to come oh, up and speak okay. too, but I think that's a valid question. So would you like, this is my question to you, um, I could ask the applicant to come forward and tell us why they're not going to the Committee of Adjustment first. Would you like to hear that? Oh, I think, yeah, that's, uh, that's in my view, essential. Okay. That's okay. And I, I, my questions are going to be, uh, my comments are... So we have more comments than questions already. So I think that um, what I'm going to do, because that is within the committee, I've heard that from more than just the two um, members to my left. And uh, it is a very large question. It is the elephant in the room, so to speak. So, Robert, can you come forward and, uh, or who else would be the best one to... Okay, Brian? Brian Cascarandi. So just to answer that question... As to why, the last one? why you pulled out of the, uh, why you um, withdrew from the uh, your scheduled Same guy? time at the committee of adjustment, Ms. Brian Casagrande. Yes. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of committee. Brian Casagrande, senior planner of FOTEN Consultants. Um, the simple answer to your question is that the Committee of Adjustment will tie us to the plans submitted. And our expectation is that there's a high chance, or at least a reasonable chance, that through this process, changes to those plans might be stipulated. So to avoid a situation where I would bring my client to a Committee of Adjustment hearing, he pays those fees and effectively all the consulting fees to go along with it, only to have to return to the committee in the event that changes are dictated out of this process would just simply not be reasonable uh, in terms of practical practicalities. I should also say that consistently whenever I've had applications that have to go before the Heritage Committee as well as Committee of Adjustment, um, such as this application, I've been directed by staff to do it in that order, I expect for those exact reasons. And what, so, which, which staff? The committee of adjustment. No staff? planning staff at the city and heritage staff at the city of Ottawa. Uh, and it makes sense to me because of the exact reasons I mentioned. If we end up getting tied to plans at the committee, those should be plans that we're yes, sticking okay. with. Okay, so I see that the our staff are giving their concurrence on the fact that no, you're not give a, because I'm not the planner on this well, but a general, uh, generally um, it, it is our practice to ask um, to uh, applicants to go to the Committee of Adjustment um, after Heritage Committee, but in this particular instance, because of the nature of the variances sought, um, we determined within our, our section that uh, they should, and legal staff, that they should go to Committee of Adjustment first. So they went last week but ask for a deferral. 
Mr. Cassidy, I, I guess I would say that there was never any clarity on my part as to whether we were to go to committee of adjustment first. There was an acknowledgement that the standard practice is to go to this committee first and committee second. My sense of it, quite honestly, is given the level of, of public interest in the application, the staff felt that um, in, in the face of those concerns that they would rather have the application go to committee first. But when presenting them the very concern that I presented to this committee, which is, well, what if we get tied to plans and then you want changes, there was no real response to that other than, well, I guess you'd have to go back to the committee of adjustment. And I think that's a very impractical uh, uh, expectation. Okay, so for everyone in the room, just so that you are clear, I do have a list of speakers, but this is important, and, and in most of the, uh, or many of the uh, correspondence that we have received, and probably some of your comments, it is going to speak to the size of the lots and that sort of thing. So that's why we're going this way first, to, to get that cleared up. And hang on, Brian, because uh, Vice Chair Podolsky would like to speak. Brian, I'd like to ask a question so that this committee can understand what the variances would be Certainly. because it's not really in any of our documents. So if you could help educate the committee with the site plan to inform us about what the, um, the variances are that you would be applying when you go to the committee of adjustment, just so that we can understand this better. Yeah, so that's, that's a very good point. So everyone, what, uh, um, if, if you may not have heard, uh, Vice Chair Podolsky is asking for if, if we were the Committee of Adjustment, which we aren't, what would they be asking for in variances so that we can see the nature of, of, those, cha of those changes requested? Certainly. So just so I get clear in advance. And take your right. time, and, and maybe staff, you can, as he's speaking, you could highlight on the, uh, on the diagram, if possible. So part one uh, on our reference plan, which isn't on the screen but is effectively the, the lot on the corner, um, is seeking a reduced minimum lot area of 781.3 square meters. Um, sorry, I've got this backwards. Part one is the interior lot and part lot one is seeking a minimum lot area of 781.3 square meters whereas the bylaw minimum is 925. Um, part one has a second variance related to the minimum required lot width of 24.62 meters, whereas the minimum requirement is 27. And then um, finally, that uh, application or that lot has a requested increase to the maximum density, um, uh, which is 12.8 units per hectare or one per 700 and 81.25 square meters, uh, whereas the bylaw permits a maximum of 10.87 units per hectare or one per 919.96 square meters. Part two also has, so this is the corner lot, has three variances. Um, they seek a, or we seek a lot area variance of, to allow an 889 square meter lot, whereas the bylaw requires 925. We seek a, oh, see, I think I've got this backwards again. So the previous ones I was referring to was, in fact, the corner lot. I don't have my reference plan in front of me. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. So, so the pre, I didn't Probably expect. Probably weren't exactly. Sure. And so. So the previous three were for the corner lot. The next three are for the interior lot. Um, so it seeks a required lot area of 889 square meters, whereas the requirement's 925. I was right the first Okay, sorry. I was right the first time. I really apologize for the confusion. So the second lot at the Wait, corner. Wait, just a question. Just when you say you were right the first time. Uh, <laughs> Maybe I should start again. Right, you start again and yes. refer to them as lot A and lot B because that's what's, that's what's shown up there. Okay. okay, I can do that. So, so lot A which is the interior lot. Um, the area, 781.3 compared to the requirement of 925. The width of 24.62, requirement 27. And the density, 
12.8 units per hectare uh, versus 10.87 is the requirement. Lot B at the corner, area 889 versus 925. Uh, rear yard, which is seeking 4.5 compared to a 12 meter requirement and density 11.25 versus 10.87 per hectare. So on the second one, on lot B, where you were talking about requesting the reduction in the backyard, Yes. Um, what would be the problem with shifting it? Is it purely aesthetics that you don't want to shift it forward, or is that an impact in yet another request for a variance on the front yard? No, I think there's the capability to move it forward. It presents a couple of challenges. Uh, firstly, we'd like to have the garage access as far away from the corner as po possible. So as you move it forward, that becomes more challenging. Uh, secondly, just being a corner, corner lot and um, characteristic of this community, uh, we wanted to have a more expansive front yard feel to it, if you will, a green feel. Um, so that was the other reason. And then thirdly, um, you know, from a purely um, um, lot development interest perspective, it offers the building a, a better view of, uh, of the lake, uh, whereas if you bring it forward, it, it wouldn't have that opportunity to the same extent. Okay, thank you. I know um, uh, Member Smallwood has a question of staff, but does anyone have any questions of, of, uh, of uh, Mr. Casagrande at this time? Remembering that you're going to have your opportunity in the regular lineup to come back. Thanks very much for coming forward. My pleasure. This time. Um, uh, Sandy, question of staff? Yes, um, thank you. Sure. The, um, I think the community concern is very clear on, on this issue and it relates primarily to Section 3 lot division. Um, the statement is in the Heritage Conservation District study is that the existing pattern of lot division should be protected. And it would seem fairly clear in this case that what's happening is it's not being protected. The, uh, the variances, um, if granted, would lead other people to assume that any lot of this size would be uh, open for severance and subdivision, which would then inevitably at some point lead to the, to the reduction of the, of the larger lots, which um, not point two says is that the retention of existing larger lots should be encouraged. Now, in this case, there isn't an existing house, but it doesn't say should only be encouraged where there is an existing house on the inventory. It says the existing larger lot should be encouraged. By doing this, it would seem to do the exact opposite. Um, so I guess my question to you is, is that how do you reconcile what seems to be a contradiction in the, the goals and the objectives of the HCD and, and what you're proposing? Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, yes, I recognize that um, the guideline that says it should be encouraged, particularly where there is an existing house, um, does not mean that if there is no existing house, it shouldn't be encouraged. Um, however, when these proposals come forward, we, we do react to them. Um, your comment about, you know, this could set a dangerous uh, precedent that this is going to start happening all over the village, we did consider that. Um, we did uh, do some analysis uh, of other lots in the village where this could be possible um, using uh, the zoning bylaws as the tool and, and looking at lots that did not have a house of significance that could provide the frontage on the street, so not any of those long, you know, long lots where you, you, you have an interior lot and they have to have a corner lot basically or a very wide lot. Um, and we found there were less than 10 in the, in the village of Rockcliffe Park where this could potentially happen. Um, and there are approximately 750 lots in uh, Rockcliffe Park. So um, it, it was not felt um, that this was going to open the door to, uh, to changing the overall cultural landscape of Rockcliffe Park. Uh, in terms of saying the existing pattern of lot, protection, lot division should be protected, I would also say that the second half of that guideline is including the wide variety of lot sizes and shapes. And it was our opinion that the division of this lot 
into two lots that are not uh, dissimilar to other lots in the Heritage Conservation District did not negatively impact the character of the HCD. If I may, uh, but it would seem that the word used is encouraged. This doesn't seem to be encouraging the uh, retention of existing larger lots. It seems to be doing the opposite. And as well, uh, the existing pattern of lot sizes includes large and small. If they continue to sever lots, then there won't be any large ones to protect. That wasn't really a question. It was a statement, so I'm not looking for a response. Um, good. Remembering, we still have probably six to eight speakers. So, be, so be, usually what you do is you have some kind of an open issue mind. Where she said, if I'm not mistaken, that you looked at lots where they could be divided horizontally. If there's a large backyard, could they not just run the driveway up the side and sever them that way? That is not something that we would support under the Heritage Act, simply because that would not be characteristic of the lot pattern of Rockcliffe Park. Uh, we did feel that these lots are, the, the resulting lots from this proposal would be characteristic of the pattern of Rockcliffe Park. Well, I wouldn't have thought you. <clears throat> Thank you for not going further. Anybody else have any questions before we go to the delegations? Okay, well. Thank you very much. So our first speaker is Anna Klar. Welcome, Anna. Hit it, hit it again. She, she tried. There you go. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak together before this committee. Um, I live across the street from uh, this lot that is uh, before us today. Um, I am very upset by this, by this whole process, and uh, I have, uh, I guess my points are minor compared to the ones that my neighbors are going to bring up, uh, but uh, the first thing I would like to repeat the point that Mr. Clark brought up. I don't understand how can we be looking at two houses when we have only one lot. It's my understanding that only one house can be built in one lot, and I haven't seen a project for one single house to be built on this lot if the current house is demolished. So I don't understand the logics of this. So I guess it's a question on, or a comment, I don't know. But I, still, I don't understand that and how it can happen. Um, regarding the comments that the, uh, the, the recommendations that these buildings, the new proposed buildings, if they go ahead, they will not have a negative impact on, the, uh, on Rockcliffe Park. In my personal observation, they are not typical of Rockcliffe Park. Uh, and uh, certainly, I would not like to look at them from my window every morning. Um, but that's my personal observation. And my main comment, and it's, uh, again, regarding what I see from my window, and what I like the most, or one of the things I like the most of Rockcliffe Park is probably the abundance of mature trees. And uh, there are a lot of mature trees on this big lot currently. I counted at least 12. And they include some very good quality trees such as maple, uh, sugar maple, uh, white pine. I think there's two white pines. And then a number, about 10 cedars or firs. I'm not sure exactly what they are. These trees are at least 20 to 30 years old, maybe even over 50, some of them. Uh, they're probably going to be destroyed if this project goes ahead. I don't think we will see them back, even if an attempt is made to um, replant them. At least I won't see them in my lifetime. Uh, the cedar hedges, okay, cedars grow fast, yes, but I don't, I don't see that cedars have such a heritage value as a tree that's over 50 years old. Um, so this is, this is basically all of, I have to say. So I'm going to ask um, Leslie and Ms. Collins to speak to the, the landscaping and what will be kept, a, a comment on the trees, which is the last piece of what you were talking about. But generally, generally you live across the street and you're against the process being this before the severance. That's one point, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so because I don't see, I don't know if the surveillance is not approved, and I hope it will not be. I will vehemently oppose it for the reasons that have been already presented here. The lots will be smaller, definitely, and, and I do think that it, it will set a precedent for the village. Um, did, but did you hear um, the investigation that Ms. Collins did, and uh, I think with some of the other staff, they looked at the entire inventory. So I'm, I'm going to ask you to speak to the trees that are presently there, the mature trees that are there, um, and uh, what will happen with them, and also, again, to the, um, uh, the last comment uh, that, uh, that uh, Ms. Clark had. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can just, just sit there because there may be questions for you. Um, so in, th through you, Madam Chair, uh, in reference to the landscape plan, on the site plan, it's difficult to see on the screen, there are one, two, three um, trees proposed for removal. One, uh, they're very faint. I will show you with the mouse. Yeah. There is one here in the front uh, where this walkway is. There is one here at the back where the house is, and there is one over here where the driveway is. The rest of the trees on the lot um, at this point are proposed for retention. Uh, it is something that, as, as this committee knows, when you see, um, you see so many applications in Rockcliffe Park, it's one of the things that we really try to push, is the retention of mature trees and other mature landscape features like hedges uh, in the village, as it is one of the most uh, important heritage attributes of the, of the village of Rockcliffe Park. So that would be something that um, through the, if, if this were approved both by this committee and by the Committee of Adjustment, um, through the building process, we would be looking to the property owner to ensure that those trees are protected um, and uh, that they remain uh, on site. If I can comment, I think the three trees that you mentioned that are marked for removal are the most mature ones. I think it's the sugar maple, a big pine. I think one of them is a white pine, and the other one is another kind of pine. They're the most mature on the lot. They cannot stay there based on this plan. Thank you. Yeah, Leslie, I think that the question of uh, the cutting of mature trees for this proposal has come up. I see the site plan here, but as you quite rightly say, you can't tell visually from the plan the nature of or the location of the mature trees that would be cut. I think that uh, I'm actually a little disappointed in that because we uh, generally have a plan which shows where trees are being cut and sometimes an arborist report describing the nature of those trees. You had pointed out to us with the little cursor three of the trees, and but I think you verbally said that there were four or more. Um, can, for the committee's benefit, we, could we understand where the other uh, trees are that are being cut. So we understand the impact on the landscape. Uh, my apologies. I did say four, and there are four. Uh, the fourth is over here on the other property. So it's right here. On the printed version of the site plan, you should be able to see it. it they are grayed out, which is typical of, of trees that to, are to be removed on a site plan. It's just it's not showing up um, on, on the screen very well. So there are, there are four trees. Um, I do not have the, the type or species in front of me. Um, it might be something the applicant uh, could speak to. Okay, I'm just looking for that page that would have the um, the trees. Maybe just on the on the I, okay, on the topic of trees, though, uh, maybe you could speak to what is being retained. So there's a lot of trees shown there. I mean, some of them obviously are going to be new, but uh, of the ones that are there that Miss um, Clark spoke about. So I've just uh, brought up an image on the screen. Again, I guess it's because it's a bit bright in here. It's difficult to see. But uh, what you see on the plan are uh, mainly retained trees. Um, there are some new hedges and uh, other landscaping proposed um, 
at the front of the of the new house, uh, both new houses. But the mature trees that you see along here uh, are proposed for retention, and then also the uh, whoops. The cedar hedge that you see uh, on the other screen over here. Actually, I'll bring it up on both screens. Sorry. The cedar hedge that you see here on the right-hand side of the screen is uh, proposed for retention as well. So mo most of what you see on the existing plan on the plan is existing. Um, there is some new planting proposed uh, at the front of the house. Um, but the, the existing cedar hedge that goes all the way around the property as well as the four or five, uh, there's five mature trees in the front yard of 575 Old Prospect and there are two in the front yard of uh, 565 Old Prospect that uh, are being retained. So you are seeing the cutting of four mature trees, uh, the retention of the rest of the trees on the site and the addition of some new hedges and, and other shrubs and, and ground cover. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so our next speaker is John Mearns. Mr. Mearns, welcome. You two live on Old Prospect Road. Yes. Hi. I live at 550 Old Prospect Road across the street, and I'd like to start by saying I uh, vehemently oppose this, uh, this proposal. Um, I also feel, as uh, Mr. Clark stated, that the process has been um, badly, uh, um, let's say, managed in terms of the proposal that we see here isn't even the same proposal that was put before the community uh, for the um, a committee of adjustment meeting. So, in, uh, in other words, a lot of the things that we are going to be talking about, uh, we're operating on two different uh, sets of uh, data, basically. Okay. So, to start with, I can't really see how the uh, staff can support this proposal, given that, based upon what I've seen, there's at least ten variances from either the zoning bylaw or the official plan uh, as it's uh, laid out for the village of Rockcliffe Park. Uh, and of those 10 variances uh, or violations, uh, at least three of them are very significant. The first one being that the lot size for lot A, as it is, is proposed to be 16% below what the zoning bylaw allows. Now this is not an insignificant number. That's, you know, you're cutting off one-sixth of this entire desk, okay? Um, and that by itself is, is a serious issue. Uh, rear yard setback, 63% below what the zoning bylaw uh, would, uh, would envisage. Uh, driveways, now here's where we get into a big difference between what we saw and what's uh, on the table here. Uh, my calculation was that the driveways, while the lot sizes were going to be smaller, the overall driveway uh, requirement was going to be 31% larger than what the zoning bylaws would, uh, would allow for. Uh, we've also got now this notion of increased density uh, beyond zoning bylaw um, allowances, which wasn't part of the uh, original variances that I'd, that I'd looked at, uh, lot width also. Um, from the perspective of uh, density, and city staff said that this probably wouldn't have a big impact on the village in terms of setting a precedent. Well, I live across the, across the road. My lot's about close to 26,000 square feet. So if this was allowed to go ahead, presumably, and my lot's very wide, I could put three houses on my property. So in this little corner of the village where once there were two homes, now there's the potential for at least five. And that doesn't even account for some of the other properties that are over 20,000 square feet in the immediate vicinity. Okay. Um, I'd also like to touch upon the fact that this is a significantly dangerous corner. The, the images don't really show the full story here. Um, this corner is a 90 degree corner. Removing the hedge is only a... Um, 
small solution to a big problem because this corner is an approach to uh, a significant hill which in the winter time is always very icy so as a result people approaching from Lansdowne going up prospect usually have to accelerate fairly hard just to be able to get up the hill okay um, the roads uh, originally were laid out sometime in the late 1800s and were never designed for car traffic, let alone substantial car traffic. Um, and as such, I, I walk my dog at least twice a day around this corner and I'm constantly having to veer off into the verge just to avoid the cars that can't even see me coming around from Lansdowne, basically. Okay. Not to mention cyclists that zip down the road at, uh, you know, probably 60 kilometers an hour, skateboarders and whatever else. This is a, a disaster waiting to happen if we, you know, increase the density and the amount of access in terms of driveways. The current driveway is about as far as it could possibly be from the corner, okay, whereas now we've got two driveways that are going to uh, uh, inject traffic into not the, uh, the outside apex but the inner arc of the, of the corner which is, uh, you know, a significant safety concern as far as I'm concerned. Um, the other thing is, I don't know if the city's taken into account that uh, there's road work that's going to be done here, new sewers and whatnot, and the overall um, vision of uh, the work once it's complete is to actually decrease the width of the paved area, uh, particularly on Old Prospect. Okay, so that's something that uh, will, you know, again, we'll, we'll be dealing with less pavement, not more pavement. So. In summary, I'd, I'd just like to say that, uh, number one, uh, this does definitely open the door to, uh, you know, uh, quite significant increased densification in the area. And while I know that the city uh, uh, sort of looks forward to that as far as, you know, densification in transit areas, this is about as far as you can get from, a, from any kind of uh, public transit uh, within the city, so there's no benefit to that. Uh, it doesn't in any way, shape, or form contribute to the uh, heritage character, as far as I can see. Um, there were clear uh, process and procedural flaws to how this is all unfolding. Uh, the proposal itself is also uh, totally in uh, counter to the principles of the overall community design plan. The community um, opinion on it, the overall uh, view of the direct neighbors, etc. And, uh, uh, and last uh, but not least, I think that it represents uh, some danger to, uh, to safety. Okay, well thank you very much. I don't know if anyone has any questions, but I, I will say that the existing conditions that you were speaking about are ones that you should address through your uh, association with the support of, of, uh, of Councillor Clark, because certainly the ones you're talking about with the road safety and about the, the visual um, impediments and that, those are things that have, like, no matter if, if nothing happens, that's stuff that's already happening, so you should have a conversation. And I think part of the issue is going to be you're going to have people that are going to say, save the hedge, and other people are going to say, pair it back a little bit, so we have, and, and that's a, that is very much a local decision that no matter what happens mm -hmm. with this application, whether the lots are severed, whether this is approved, that's a conversation that that um, you should have that. True, but just to address that point, I would say that uh, as the lot is currently laid out with its current driveway, it's probably at the sort of best possible tolerances vis-a-vis <coughs> -vis safety. Changing the configuration will, will uh, you know, be to the detriment of those tolerances. Thank you very much. Anyone have any questions of Mr. Mayor? No, thank you very much for coming okay. forward. Next up we have is uh, John Edmund. John? Thank you very much. Um, unlike the previous two speakers, uh, we live outside the, uh, we do not live uh, immediate, in the immediate neighborhood could of could the you, proposal. Could you, could you please um, yeah, pull it forward to you and, and speak directly into it? Thank yeah. you. Uh, we don't live in the immediate neighborhood of the proposal, so we're not faced with it, uh, if it goes ahead. All right, how's that? Um, however, we do share with them 
uh, the strong opposition to, to the proposal. <coughs> we um, uh, are outside the uh, public notice range, uh, but we live in the same uh, city block. Um, first of all, I want to mention that I handed up, uh, handed to the registrar. Unfortunately, I didn't have it in advance, but I've handed a uh, notice, uh, a, a short paper, three-page paper, which I would ask you to look at uh, if you'd be so kind. Uh, it um, uh, has uh, basically two points. Um, it um, reviews the portions of the official Ottawa official plan, uh, the so-called former Rockcliffe uh, section, <coughs> and I recite there three or four uh, elements of the plan, all of which uh, indicate that the uh, whole intent of the city with respect to Rockcliffe is essentially conservative of the existing elements. Um, I, I won't take you through all of that, but I do want to read one passage. Uh, it says that it's therefore the desire of the community as expressed in this plan to protect the present environment, including the spatial relationships between buildings. Now, uh, in this particular city block, all of the lots, I understand, are over 10,000 square feet, so that these uh, lot, two lots proposed would be complete anomalies. Um, and uh, um, I, I, I do want also to endorse uh, uh, Mr. Smallwood's point about uh, pre the presidential value of uh, any decision that you make in this matter. Um, what the paper does is to, it, it tries to um, show the fact that the uh, variance issues which are, which will be before the Committee of Adjustment, presumably, if that is rescheduled at some point, are ne nevertheless inextricably linked with the um, issues of construction of these houses. Um, the uh, um, the evidence that we already have is that the uh, lot A, for example, is almost 16% below deficient uh, in respect to the lot area, and it's something like two and a half uh, meters deficient with respect to frontage. Um, I cite in this paper uh, a passage from the official plan called Policy for Infill Development. Uh, just to record it, it's point two, point four, point two, point two, and it's policy three. And what it says is that, uh, I won't read the whole thing, but I'll try to paraphrase it. It says that for any lot that was not in existence in 1988, that um, the uh, construction may be permitted if the lot has either insufficient frontage or insufficient lot area, but not both. And then there's an exception, kind of grandfather clause for those lots in existence before 1988. Now, we've been advised by staff that this provision doesn't apply to the lot. Well, of course, it doesn't apply to the existing lot because that was in existence long before 1988. But it would clearly apply to lots that might be created uh, by the Committee of Adjustment decision, if they go that way, uh, in uh, uh, 2014 or 2015. So uh, I strongly urge you to consider whether this construction is even allowed under that provision by the, um, by the official plan. Um, so the, the paper, uh, just to summarize the paper, as I say, has uh, two elements. It, it um, uh, recites the uh, essentially uh, physically conservative uh, issues uh, or, or policies with respect to the former Rockcliffe and it tries to put out for you the major uh, not all of them, certainly, uh, Mr. Mearns has mentioned that there are quite a number, but uh, two or three of the most significant issues of variance. And it's, it's, uh, the point I want to make is that uh, you can't um, really distinguish, if you're going to talk about construction, you can't ignore the fact 
that uh, we're talking about two lots that don't now exist. And uh, so the, the construction uh, that is being proposed uh, um, has to be considered in the light of that, uh, of that fact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Edmund. Does anyone else, does anyone have any questions? Well, thank you for coming forward today. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Brian Dixon, followed by Ling Lu Langley. You're after Mr. Dixon. And you're here speaking on behalf of the uh, Rockwell Park Residents Association? That's correct. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. My name is Brian Dixon. I'm the president of the Rockcliffe Park Residents Association. And I'm in my sixth year as president. Uh, I think you will uh, have a fairly good idea as to what the community thinks of this particular proposal by the comments that you've already heard and the comments that you will hear. Um, the RPRA has submitted comments throughout this process, and I don't plan to repeat those now. And I have uh, prepared remarks, which I don't uh, propose to read. I'd just like to make two or three basic points. The first point is on procedure. Uh, we are very concerned uh, that we are discussing these uh, particular proposed uh, Houses as though they were already on two severed lots. Uh, we find that difficult to follow. If the lots are not severed, obviously the design issues become moot. Therefore, we believe that the Committee of Adjustment should have uh, reviewed this prior to uh, this application coming to this committee. Uh, secondly, it appears that the documentation that was submitted to the neighbors uh, is and not the same documentation that we are reviewing today, and that is of great concern to us. Finally, uh, we do have a development review uh, subcommittee uh, composed of experts which uh, provided preliminary uh, uh, points on the proposed house at 575 Prospect, uh, but the proposal for 565, this so-called placeholder, uh, was always described as simply a notional home, and somehow that 565 has transformed itself into a firm proposal uh, without our knowledge or input. Uh, now, the basic points, what does the community think of this? I've been in this position for almost six years, and I can't recall a single application which has been more divisive uh, than this particular one. Uh, sometimes a proposal can be divisive within the community. This is a proposal which has been divisive between the community or between the applicant and the community. I have heard no member of our community apart from the applicant uh, who supports this proposal. Uh, the, the RPRA has a severance policy. This particular uh, severance does not comply with that uh, policy. We also uh, think that if this were to be approved at the Committee of Adjustment as a severance, that it would uh, create a very bad precedent, as was des described by Mr. Mearns a few minutes ago. Uh, on the design issues, the Development Review Subcommittee <coughs> has expressed p preliminary uh, points on the uh, the application for 575 prospect, uh, but uh, has provided no input on the proposal for 565. Uh, therefore, uh, for all of these reasons, the RPRA strongly opposes this application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dixon. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Dixon? Thank you for coming out today. Thank you. Okay. Ling Lu Langley, welcome. Thank you. My name is Ling Lu Langli, and I live on 539 Old Prospect Road. We moved in into this neighborhood six years ago with my two young children, and we enjoy the green, the space of the, of the society. So I'm here to think, to object the proposed plan to build two houses on this corner lot. 
it doesn't harmonize to the character of the heritage village. So I'm here to ask you, please protect the Canadian heritage village and to protect the Canadian history. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we're going to go now to the applicant. And so, Robert, you have uh, registered, and I would imagine the team's coming forward, are you? Brian, you're coming back up? Good. So, gentlemen, I think that you, uh, starting with you, and then, of course, listening to everyone, um, there's a real concern about the order of, of, of these uh, applications, if you will. <clears throat> and uh, that's why I asked you to come forward first, because in the communications that we've received um, and certainly uh, um, heard, uh, that has been a big issue. The, whether or not you're successful at the Committee of Adjustment. And uh, so I'm going to, we heard from you, and I appreciate you came forward at the beginning so we could have that discussion. But now, this is your time for your presentation, so thank you. Okay, my pleasure, thank you. Um, I think really what I'd like to do is just try and respond to some of the comments that uh, were received. Uh, staff's presentation to me sufficiently covered the key issues that I would expect are most relevant to this committee. And I think it's important that the committee, um, as much as I understand the sensitivity around the consent and the minor variance applications, um, uh, keeps the um, the matter at stake at the forefront because a lot of those things are definitely things that we're going to have to deal with at committee of adjustment. I expect, as I did when the application started, that that would be uh, a contentious application, and I suspect that that's part of the reason why you heard the last comment about this being, uh, I guess, the most divisive application of this nature that this community has seen. Uh, I don't do a lot of work in Rockcliffe Park, um, and I don't expect it's subject to a lot of these types of applications. So uh, to me, that would be natural. But having said that, uh, when this application came forward to FOTEN, as we do with any application, um, we step back, we evaluate it, we see whether we think it's a defensible position with respect to the considerations that we're dealing with under the Planning Act and the Heritage Act and so on. And this is certainly one that we felt had a lot of merit for consideration. Um, the image that's before you on the screen is part of our planning rationale report that will be before the Committee of Adjustment. And I brought it forward today. It's the only image I brought forward today because um, I expected most of this dialogue would relate to um, Robert Martin's area of expertise, which is more the heritage conservation considerations. But this being one of them, I mean, you can see that we're not proposing two lots in this community that are profoundly different than the surrounding context. And if you scroll down a little bit further uh, on this image, you'll see that we've documented how these areas relate to the ones that are highlighted. And, um, you know, although the, the 565 is, is, you know, smaller in context to perhaps the bottom ones, uh, 9, 10, and 11, you know, the 575 isn't, and 565 is very much in, in line with the first three. Um, so just on the whole, um, this is not a situation where you're creating um, a, a pattern that is vastly different than the surrounding context, which of course is a primary consideration for the consent application alone. Um, with respect to the policies that were mentioned, um, and there was reference to the secondary plan and the policy three, and you know, as you've heard, that, that, and I'll read the policy so the committee is aware of it. First of all, it says, uh, the broader um, heading on this section says, where new development is proposed as infilling, which this is, council, when applicable, the land division committee or the committee of adjustment shall consider the following matters. And it goes on, and when you read number three, it says, the construction of a detached single family dwelling in areas designated as residential may be permitted on a lot which has either insufficient frontage or area, but not both, and only on lots existing as of December 5th, 1988. In such cases, the deficiency of one 
uh, of either lot frontage or area shall not exceed 25% of the minimum frontage or lot area required by the zoning bylaw. So staff have declared that this um, this policy is not applicable um, to the subject application, but I think it's important that the committee recognize that even if it were, the very nature of the consent that's before you, and I take you back to the screen on the right because it shows the proposal. If we simply angled the interior lot line to follow lands down instead of running it perpendicular to Old Prospect, we would eliminate the lot area variance on both lots. We only have one lot that's deficient in lot, sorry, lot width variance on both lots. We only have one that's deficient in lot width now. So as to completely meet this policy. So again, it's a policy. We have to consider it is the words. And the application before the Committee of Adjustment for my minor variants dealing with this, the test under the Planning Act is that we have to be in general, in, in general conformity with the official plan, which in this case is the secondary plan, general conformity. So it requires one to step back and look at what's, what the overall objective here is. And so yes, we could kink the lot line to meet this exact requirement, but to me it wouldn't be the right way to lay out the lot. So we're looking at it this way, and generally speaking with staff, they agree that that's the right approach. So even though the policy doesn't apply, we could comply with the policy is the point I'd like the committee to be aware of. Um, moving from that consideration, I think um, there was a lot of discussion about 565, the interior lot being just a placeholder. And I think there's some confusion with that terminology. It may have been presented in certain meetings, but it is before this committee because it is seeking approval for that design. And so effectively, if in the end somebody buys that lot and doesn't like the design, they'll have to go back through this process. But it's been designed by, by Barry Hoban Architect. It's certainly um, a high quality design. And the expectation is that it's going to be marketed to somebody who's going to go forward and build that building. So I don't think it's appropriate to minimize the significance of the expense and efforts that have been put into that design. Um, further, uh, as I understand it, the RPRA actually did comment on that design and it translated into the building setback being modified. So it hasn't been uh, a void of discussion and consideration. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Martin right now. I'm not sure what uh, he might want to say with respect to the, um, the heritage considerations that I think are the foremost considerations before this committee. Um, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and uh, members of committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, we were uh, retained to uh, provide a, an assessment of the impacts to the Heritage Conservation District based on the, the proposal before you. And I'd, I'd like to start off by saying that the, um, the general intent of a Heritage Conservation District is, is not that it, um, I guess, casts places in stone, uh, never subject to change. I, I happen to know the authors of the district study very well and have had many conversations about, about the study. And the, one of the main intents of a district study is that it, it recognizes that districts are living places, that they're not fixed in stone, and that the whole point of these uh, guidelines is that they provide a kind of uh, you know, rational, balanced, and, and so sort of thoughtful way to evaluate um, development proposals um, over time. So, you know, the the very intent of the, the district is is uh, allowing a degree of flexibility and continuity, and it uh, it actually recognizes that continuity of the evolution and uh, makes specific reference to uh, previous estates and parcels of land being divided over time. So, this is not a a concept that is foreign to the district. In fact, it's the very essence of the way the district has has developed over time. Um, I think um, you know Leslie um, Collins made um, a very good summation of the of the three um, areas of the district study where we need to evaluate the proposal under uh, building uh, lot division and landscape, and um, our. Our uh, heritage impact assessment uh, similarly follows those same considerations. Um, so the, the, I, I guess I'd like to respond to some of the points about uh, retention of lots. 
It doesn't say a must, it says it should. And that, in its very wording, recognizes a degree of flexibility that uh, the, um, the proposal or any proposal can be um, evaluated on, on, on many factors. Um, so the, the district studies uh, report made specific recommendations um, and if we actually just focus on those and separate ourselves from, from a lot of the, I would say, unfounded allegations about this proposal, we will actually see that the, the proposal before you is, is really very much in conformance with the very spirit and intent of the district. So the first one has to do with the dominance of soft landscape over hard landscape. And in this case, we are absolutely maintaining that dominance of, of soft over hard. In fact, the the retention of the high hedges will make at least one of the parcels of land virtually indistinguishable from the way it is currently. Uh, the second point deals with existing trees and other plantings being protected and enhanced. There are a few trees being removed. We are adding additional vegetation as part of the proposal. And so again, we're comfortable with that, that second uh, recommendation. Um, the third one also again talks to uh, retention of existing mature trees. And again, in our experience uh, on other uh, properties in the village, this doesn't mean that all trees are sacrosanct. It means that they should be removed as a last resort. And where possible, additional plantings um, should be provided as compensation and um, in such a way that the uh, district character is retained. Um, most of all, when we've assessed the proposal under the various aspects of the district study, uh, we are very comfortable that we are maintaining the high level of uh, visual continuity, uh, minimal disruption of the picturesque landscape. In terms of hard surfaces, uh, some statements have been made that we are actually increasing the hard surface, whereas the reality actually is that we are improving the percentage of hard landscape on the site and uh, changing what is an outlier or anomaly building into one that is more in conformance with the general character of the district. Um, so I guess in summary, um, from our perspective, this proposal retains a very high level of visual continuity and it respects the picturesque characteristics of the district. It remedies an, an existing atypical condition um, and removal of uh, sections of asphalt um, in terms of the uh, spirit and character of the district, again, we're, we're very comfortable that uh, this doesn't set any kind of precedent. And again, um, the city's own uh, investigation matches our own, that there are both numerous examples of lot sizes that are the same or similar, in some cases even smaller. And uh, the actual number of lots around here that could be divided in this way is, is uh, infinitesimally small. And so we're not creating some precedent or... or uh, you know, avalanche of uh, severances throughout the district. And, you know, lastly, the, the proposed division in, in these uh, uh, designs that you see allow for the maximum retention of key foliage and, uh, again, respect the uh, district's tradition of smaller building footprints on generous size lots. Uh, so I think we're, we're very comfortable that this uh, proposal in no way impacts the character of the district. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions? No. And I'm looking for questions as opposed to soliloquies, etc. Uh, Councilor Clark, I know you were. Yeah, you have. This is a question. This is in for, the cultural heritage impact but, statement. But Councilor Clark, is this a question for the applicant or staff? This is a question for the applicant. Okay, good. Or thank not you. the applicant, the the writer of the the chip here or just or whatever you want to call it. Annex A shows the, I guess, lot A almost at, on the street as opposed to the house on the left. Is that the picture that we're expected to look at, see whether it fits? I guess you're referring to uh, some images which were supplied to us by the applicant? Did the, who, who supplied this? It's attached to your cultural heritage. Um, these are provided by the, uh, the project architect there, if you like, an assembly of, of streetscape elevations. 
Yeah, except that looking at the, the existing house on the left, if you look at it, this, this looks like it's jutting out way out in front from my perception. Um, I, I think it's important to stress these are just illustrative um, the, you know, diagrams there. So you put it in them. here even though you don't support it? No, I, you're putting words in my mouth. We, we entirely support this proposal. We have borrowed an illustrative image from the uh, applicant to apply to our cover page. Okay. Anyone have any questions of the applicant? Uh, Vice Chair Podolsky? Hi, Robert and Brian. There's been some uh, debate and uh, positions uh, taken by uh, some of the neighbors, but also yourselves, about whether or not uh, on the question of, um, of lot divisions, whether this would create a precedent, uh, sorry, a precedent. Some have argued that there would be, in other words, rather than an avalanche, uh, and you've asserted that there won't be an avalanche of um, uh, severances coming up because of this precedent. Have you, on behalf of your clients, or Brian Cascogne, have you done a survey uh, of the village to assess what, using the precedent that would be um, applied here if approved, how many lots in the uh, in the village would be subject to this kind of severance. We've heard from uh, from you on one of the diagrams like this one. You've shown you know 11 lot sizes in the neighborhood that are similar to the ones that you're proposing, but you haven't outlined the larger lots. Uh, and uh, I think that the committee would like to have an idea quantitatively in the village. Uh, what this uh, approval might lead to. Uh, and I, I heard you <coughs> said before, but I'm anxious to know if you've done any homework on that. Because our staff did that work and came back to us and commented on it today. Um, so I don't know that, have you, well, well, the question is, have you looked at that? I'd like to answer the question. Um, we haven't, and I'd like to tell you why. Um, first of all, in terms of precedent, I think the screen already shows you that you have precedent with respect to lots in this community. So this application, in my view, isn't creating that precedent. Secondly, in every community that we work within, um, there's always a dominance of, uh, or a variety of lot sizes, and they don't all necessarily translate into redevelopment for many reasons. Firstly, sometimes the housing stock on the property is so valuable and so significant that it's not conducive to be removed. Second of all, somebody has to actually want to remove it. And most importantly, this is in a heritage conservation district. So there's a whole layer of analysis and approvals that has to be put forward and, and rationales like we've had to put forward to even consider whether a severance application and a removal of a building and so on is, is acceptable and appropriate. So I think Rockcliffe Park, more so than any other community in the city of Ottawa, is unlikely to see the impacts of such precedent. Does anyone have any other questions of the applicant? <clears throat> well, just stay there because I have questions of staff and then I'm going to come back to you. So how does the 90 days work here? Because if you listen to the questions that we've had from the uh, committee, questions that we, then comments that we've had from the community, comments that we um, have received, uh, communications, um, clearly the hammer over our heads is the 90 days, the application. And on a strictly personal level, like I'm, I'm, I think I'm speaking for most of the committee, but I'm <clears throat> speaking for myself, I'm very uncomfortable with it. Because even the people that have come out today, uh, we haven't had a discussion about these two buildings, really. We really haven't. We haven't. We, ha we haven't. Other than Mr. Mearns talking about the traffic, you know, but I mean, the traffic's there anyway. Uh, we have not had a conversation about 
whether we like the access, whether we like the, the, the footprint, whether we like the look of it, whether we think that it respects, it hasn't been a heritage con, uh, conversation as, a, as should be, happen, I think, at a heritage subcommittee. And, you know, it's, and then there's questions, is there, does a decision today influence the Committee of Adjustment, or does a Committee of Adjustment assist, uh, decision influence the built heritage? I'd say the two of them are married, but at the end of the day, it's got to go to planning anyways. And um, while I respect the, app, the all the work that you've done, Ms. Collins, on this file with the applicant and the community has uh, engaged in um, and certainly been compelled to respond to, I think we have a problem. And I, I look around at everyone, and our problem really is we don't have two lots today. That has, but the people that are, sh are saying yes in the audience, yes, but you might have two lots, okay? And then that argument is dispelled. So we have had situations in the past where um, on this committee, actually in our short lifespan, if you will, where we have asked the applicant if they would be willing to forsake the 90-day uh, uh, window, if you will, expand it a little bit to allow the application to have its, to be aired at the Committee of Adjustment. Because, because if there's no two lots, then we're not having a, we don't need to have a discussion about this. And when we do have a discussion about it, I would really prefer that it's based on the, the Heritage District and what these two, possible two units will, uh, the role that they will play in the integrity of that. It's, we're in a, uh, am I, am I reading everybody right that we are in a difficult position because we don't have that? So, First of all, in the 90 days, and then I would ask you to comment. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, as it currently stands, the 90 days does expire on August the 13th, so that is before the next Built Heritage Subcommittee meeting. So at this point, unless the applicant does agree to extend that 90-day timeline, um, the committee could not defer this item without it being deemed approved under the Heritage Act. Um, I would agree that uh, it is a difficult situation, and it's a bit of a chicken and an egg in terms of which should come first. Uh, and I, th I, d I do uh, think that there would be likely more clarity around uh, the, the whether or not there's two lots and we can talk about design and impact and landscape and, and that sort of thing uh, as it relates to the Ontario Heritage Act if it has already been to the Committee of Adjustment. Uh, but at this point, the applicant would have to agree to extend the 90 days in order for us to do that. And when is the next Committee of Adjustment meeting that would be possible? Well, actually, one of the residents is answering. So, does anyone in the room have that information? Can we find out, like, quickly? Um, Can we get on the agenda? Yes. Madam Chair, next meeting is on July 2nd, but it's subject maybe to go through recirculation because it's after we sign the act, as well as basically. Can you come forward, please, to the mic? This is uh, Stream Shen. He's one of our Committee of Adjustment Planners. Thank you for happening to be here today. I got to get all this started. Uh, Madam Chair, so the next committee hearing is on July 2nd, and they have them bi-weekly. However, this application was adjourned signing day, which means it was adjourned without a date. So it's subject to a recirculation process, and as well as depending on the availability of the hearing. Um, I guess I can defer the question to Mr. Okay, so there would be other, like as far as the firm date of the 90 days, et cetera, we could work around that if there was a willingness for you to go back to the Committee of Adjustment if you're interested in doing that. Um, I mean, we're currently we're meeting on the 14th. You know, if we had quorum, we could, I could certainly call a special meeting or we could even uh, do that today. Um, but, okay, so we have that information now, and, and Ms. Collins, when you wrote your report and you did all your investigation, you were doing it based on the fact that you were under the uh, assumption that if there were two lots, this is what you were working with, correct? 
Uh, through you, Madam Chair, yes, the, um, the application, the, the recommendation for approval does say subject to the approval of relevant planning applications. So my recommendation for approval is based on the assumption that it has been approved by the Committee of Adjustment because okay. it, it's difficult to do it otherwise. The whole thing is difficult right now. And over back over to you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So, so first I'd like to just clarify that although the application was adjourned sine die, we've actually reapplied and uh, from my understanding we're slated for the July 17th Committee of Adjustment hearing because that would put us past Council and Planning Committee's decision in the event that a recommendation moves forward as, as planned here. Um, I mean, just as a basic practice, I tend to advise my clients that when there's an interest in adjournments to satisfy whatever approval body I'm before, that I encourage them to do so. What I'm struggling with here is, is I don't know how I get around the first concern that I mentioned, which is that if we get it tied to those plans, which is what the committee adjustment is going to want to do, how do I avoid the situation where my client has to go back to the committee of adjustment again? And to me, this dilemma that, that you're having, Madam Chair, is not a whole lot different than what I face actually sometimes with the Urban Design Review Panel in the City of Ottawa. We go there with a project, it might be a 30-story condominium somewhere, and the, the panel has great difficulty, some of them, with the height that's being contemplated. So the, the height that's being contemplated in that circumstance is going to be through a different process. It's going to be through a rezoning process. And so we're simply asking them, look at the design. That's why we're before you. Make the assumption that that process is going to be able to be followed and that the recommendation is going to come forward. If it doesn't, we'll be back before you. So I put the same, the same question back to this panel. I mean, you're concerned that there wasn't a lot of dialogue about the design and the heritage considerations. I'd suggest either we try and have that dialogue or maybe there isn't a lot of concern about those considerations and the whole concern of this application is the consent. So given that it's this recommendation and planning committee's approval is going to be conditional on that approval, I don't see what, what the harm and the concern is. Well, I think that you've been in the room for the same length of time that I have been talking about this and I think that I, I, I think, and again, it's, it's difficult for me to say because we haven't had a vote or anything, but I have been a councillor for a long time and I've sat at a lot of committee meetings and that, and I'm thinking that based on the concerns that we have with the cart being before the horse or vice versa or the chicken and the egg or whatever uh, an analogy you want to use, it does exist. And so the outcome not to determine what the outcome of the vote would be, but if the outcome of the vote uh, isn't in favor of the staff recommendation, then where are you? I don't know what the answer to that is. I just put it out there, and that's why we're having this discussion. Um, because right now, the, the two homes are absolutely um, hypothetical until we have two lots. And I, I believe that that's why I asked the question, and Mr. Mizzi, that's why I asked the question, um, does the decision of the Committee of Adjustment uh, bear on the uh, Heritage uh, Subcommittee, Built Heritage Subcommittee, or does the Built Heritage um, on the uh, Committee of Adjustment? I would say that the Committee of Adjustment decision on Built Heritage in this case would be the the greater, but Mr. Mizzi? Uh, Madam Chair, if it might help, our department provides written correspondence or a letter of comment to the Committee of Adjustment on almost every single application that goes before it. I couldn't see why in this particular case, if it went to the Committee of Adjustment, we couldn't craft a statement in our letter that should the Committee of Adjustment grant the severance, that it be conditional on minor design changes left to the discretion of the general manager of the department or something along those lines so that the applicant isn't 100% tied to the plans that appear before the committee. Mr. Casagrande? So again, I mean, if there's a strong enough willingness that that's what you'd like you know, my client to do, I'll take the recommendation back. But 
I'm, I'm then going to Committee of Adjustment with my hands tied in a manner that I'm not normally before them on this application. Except no more than you are here because you don't have a decision that there's two lots. So really it's the same thing. What you would be going to the Committee of Adjustment is saying we would like to have these exceptions so that we have the two lots and these are our plans. And we've, we, we have presented to the Built Heritage Subcommittee. They have chosen to, um, and I'd look to Ms. Enta, whether we could perhaps recess it or what would we have to do so that we're, you know, we've, we've had, we've spent the due diligence in having it before us and, 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 and asking questions and having the public speak and having the applicants speak. Um, how would you recommend that if we desired to, we could proceed uh, in a way including Mr. Mizzi's comments? Uh, Madam Chair, it's uh, my recommendation that <clears throat> under the Heritage Act, the applicant can enter into an agreement to have an extension of time, and so I would recommend that we enter into that extension of time. Uh, additionally, with respect to Mr. Mizzi's comments, um, certainly that's our experience. Um, we deal with implementing development agreements uh, arising out of conditions of the Committee of Adjustment on a regular basis, and certainly conditions relating to heritage-driven design changes as a result of having to come back to committee would be uh, something I would recommend having explained to the Committee of Adjustment when Mr. Cressagrande presents to them. Okay, so... July 17th is the date that you currently are going to go back to the Committee of Adjustment. August the 14th is our next meeting. Planning Committee is, Chris, when's the Planning Committee in August? 21st. And Council's the 22nd? 27th. That's not that big a stretch. That would be two weeks, actually, because that would get an extension of two weeks. So even if we took it to the end of August, September 1st, it gives you the time to go to the Committee of Adjustment, to go to the Built Heritage with that decision, to go to planning, and to have full council support. So let me confer with my client if you would. He's in the back. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay.
Mm. Councillor Clark? Councillor Clark? Yes, Robert? Um, I just wanted to, um, again, comment on these, um, these buildings seen as placeholders or hypothetical. Um, for, for us, they're not hypothetical. In fact, for us to do or to perform our CHIS, we actually require um, uh, building proposals because it's the only way that we can evaluate ratios of, of uh, building to lot area, areas of hard services, um, you know, rhythm and proportion, uh, which is, those are all characteristics described under the district study. So uh, we actually require these buildings to be um, developed and shown so that we can actually make a fair and proper assessment. Um, and, you know, I'd also, uh, you know, comment. I don't, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not arguing no. that. Okay. Uh, just so you know that. Yeah, no, and I, and I would also comment that the, the counterpart of smaller lot sizes has also been uh, a recent uh, spate of, of uh, individuals agglomerating lots, like combining two or three lots for larger ones. So this is part of the ebb and flow and the recognition that we have a living organism here in this district. It's not, it's not static. And at planning committee or here, we get into that conversation too, whether where people presume that a conser heritage conservation district or a community design plan is set in stone with no ability to maneuver, and if that was the case, you wouldn't be allowed to make an application that was in any way different. So what it, but to the proposal that I put forward, that you go ahead with your meeting on July the 10th, is that what the date was, 17th? And then we um, table this item, so we're not having an opinion on it today, but we table it, and we have it first on the agenda on the 14th of August, have it go to planning on the 21st, and have it go to council on the 27th. Um, presuming, of course, you know, that's... Ms. Anta? Is that what I said? Is that the... Yeah. Yes, Madam Chair, my so and, and we would still need your agreement, though, to have the extension of the 90 days extended by till August 31st or September 1st, which would be a matter of two weeks. So uh, I've consulted with my client, and he's prepared to agree to do that and, and to put that into writing. Um, he's asked me for one consideration, and this stems from the fact that I mean, this is a relatively small project, and there's been you know, a lot of un unanticipated costs. I mean, one example is that when he originally prepared the application, he was uh, advised that a CHIS was not required. Uh, staff never required it, but eventually they strongly recommended it, so that's an expense that's come forward. In addition, we've had to adjourn the Committee of Adjustment application because of the delay in this committee's hearing, which cost him money because that's a recirculation fee. And now I'm returning effectively. Wait a minute, delay in what committee's hearing? The Committee of Adjustment, because we adjourned the original Committee of Adjustment application to try and backdate. So you had an extra cost there. Exactly. But that's not our, that's it, not None of this is, done. I mean, these are all realities of doing development, but I so, just, I, Okay, I, so on those things, Mr. Mizzy, can you um, speak to any of it and maybe uh, reduce that being a factor? If we're through you, Madam Chair, if we're speaking to the issue of waiving or reduction of fees, while the department through the general manager has some authority under the delegation bylaw related to zoning bylaw amendments, site plan control, we don't, to my recall, have any authority over fees related to the committee of adjustment. So my client's not asking for relief under those considerations. It just sets the um, framework for one request, and that is if the committee, this committee, was willing to give him any indication of wh what their thoughts are on the present staff report as presented, because, you know, his reality now is go through a committee of adjustment process, get that approval, return to this committee again, pay myself and Robert Martin to return here again, um, all without knowing basically any discussion today on the heritage merits of the application. Um, I don't know whether the committee feels comfortable with that request, but I put it forward. And we don't have an answer for you on that, and if you want to give up your time for free, well, you know, that would be nice too. Uh, but Councillor Hobbs actually has um, concerns because, uh, Councillor Hobbs? Thanks, Madam Chair. Yes, I, I, 
You know, I feel we are having the heritage discussion today, and, and I may be the only person in the room that feels that way, uh, based on the discussions that have been ha happening here. But I see a report from our heritage planners that say that what is being proposed, hypothetical or not, would fit within the heritage uh, designation of this this uh, area. So, um, you know, I I, it, it's a, I think it's a really hard thing where we actually have to divide ourselves from the Committee of Adjustment or from whoever else will be talking about this because all we're talking about is, is, is this applicable within the heritage uh, um, district? Would this be an applicable development? And, and I think that, uh, that you're right, Mr. Casagrande, in saying that we should be making some kind of a, a, a statement on that. Because if, if what we're saying today is we're happy if this goes back to Committee of Adjustment and then it will come back here, that's a carte blanche stamp that we're going to give this then, I guess. Or are we just going to have the heritage discussion after that. So if the Committee of Adjustment comes back and says, yes, you can sever the lots and you can do these minor variances, what are we going to say then? And, and, you know, is there something different that's going to come forward in terms of I the heritage aspects or not? And I think it changes the dialogue well, from where I, we are I, today. I'd like to know how, and, and with uh, Ms. Collins, how would that change the dialogue? I mean, you're, you're doing this based on on the Committee of Adjustment decision uh, allowing for it. So how would it change the heritage discussion that we're having here? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I, I think that's uh, sort of up to the committee in terms of how it would change the discussion. Uh, but in terms of what your decision would be, would you be changing your recommendation or um, what, what is being put forward on your report? No, the, the, the recommendation under the Heritage Act from staff would not change uh, resulting from the Committee of Adjustment uh, uh, decision simply because we're looking at two different pieces of legislation here. We're, looking, we're, we're examining this under the Ontario Heritage Act and the Rockcliffe Park Heritage Conservation District and the Committee of Adjustment is looking at it under the Planning Act and, and the requirements of, of that piece of legislation and the official plan and the zoning bylaw and all those sort of things. So. The, the decision, I guess, before this committee today is, are, is this proposal appropriate to the character of the Rockcliffe Park Heritage Conservation District? If the committee feels that they need that decision from the Committee of Adjustment in order to be able to make their decision, then I think that's, that's the committee's uh, choice. So that's where I feel that, that we're sort of in this conundrum because if this committee today, if we did go forward to decide on it today and, and the, the vote is no, I think that's a negative impact for the applicant and uh, obviously, um, um, and, but, but I don't know um, what impact our committee should be making on the Committee of Adjustment in terms of, you know, do, do, do what, uh, is what a council decision how does that impact your, your, sorry, a committee decision? How does that impact the Committee of Adjustment? I, I don't think it should be, just as we shouldn't be impacting their decision. But, you know, we're all people. Um, so there are, um, there, there are thoughts uh, that, that we all have that maybe don't conform to, uh, to what the, the bylaws are. But I, I just have a real concern here that we spend a lot of time talking about something that was that is not within the scope of our, our decision here in this Built Heritage um, Committee, which is just whether or not this conforms to the uh, Rockcliffe uh, Heritage designation or the district uh, designation. And, um, I, and I feel uncomfortable with that. And, and I feel that it puts us puts us as a committee in a bind coming back saying, okay, well, we're now relying on what the Committee of Adjustment says. Are we going to have a completely different discussion here or is it going to be the same as today and, and, and what, what is the result of that if we come back and we still all have a bunch of no's here? So, because we're going to be saying no on the same thing theoretically that we would be saying no or yes to today. And so I just, I have a, co a concern and I, and I, yet I want to be um, considerate of how this might impact the applicant if, uh, if, if we went forward with a vote here today. And, and I do feel for, um, certainly for the uh, residents that have spoken here today, I just feel that we, we really need to adhere to what our responsibilities are on this committee and, and, I, and we, we are so often met with this gray area of, you know, how we, we impact everybody else and how we uh, relate to everybody else. And I'm, I think we should be just addressing the question of the, of the heritage. It does this fit within the district or no? Our heritage planners are saying, yes, it does. 
with the hypothetical um, application. So that's my two cents. And I just want to point out that of everyone on council, nobody deals with committee adjustment more than Councillor Hobbs does. She has more applications than anybody else, so she has that experience, certainly, and so I really appreciate um, how you've tried to bring that back to what we're supposed to be doing. That's the problem. That's not what the pro discussion has been. And if it goes to the, when it goes to the Committee of Adjustment and it comes back here, we're going to be having a discussion just about one thing, just about the heritage. You know, and, and I tell, I'll tell all of you in the audience that have already spoken, you're not going to be talking about the traffic and things like that. It's going to be purely on the heritage. And, our, and, 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 you, and you know, because you've read the report, our heritage staff have done their due diligence and they believe that it does fit. So that is, I think, the reason why uh, I made the recommendation because Right now, I think the decision is not going to be based on heritage um, and our role in that process and that piece because we're not in a position today from listening to everybody to have that. So, <clears throat> Member Smallwood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to your point about discussion of heritage, I believe that the, the issue with respect to heritage Refers, is referred to in the Heritage Conservation District, uh, items number one and two, the existing pattern of lot division should be protected, and item number two, the retention of existing larger lots. Based on this application, neither of those points are, it doesn't conform with either of those points. So based on that, I would move rejection of this proposal. Now, if it goes to Committee of Adjustment and they approve it, then that objection disappears. So I think if the, if the question is how would we vote today, I would say based on these two points, I would move that we reject the proposal. So that is a heritage discussion and it's directly related to the Heritage Conservation District. This, I cannot see how this uh, is encouraging the retention of larger lots. It's doing the opposite. And it's also not uh, respecting the existing pattern because it's changing it. So on those two points, this does not conform with the Heritage Conservation District. I would move that we reject it. If the Committee of Adjustment agrees that this can be done, then we can have the balance of the discussion. But you're not moving that at this time. You're just talking about it. Uh, Member Quinn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I would just like to support what uh, Member Smallwood has just said. Uh, I do feel we have had a heritage discussion today uh, for the, those points exactly uh, that are part of the definition of what is important within the Rockcliffe Park Heritage Conservation District, and it does indeed discuss lot size, etc. Uh, so, and the recommendation from staff is based on the assumption that that approval has taken place. And I think that's the key issue here. So I do support what you uh, ha are recommending, Madam Chair, in terms of the deferral, because like uh, Member Smallwood, I would not be able to support this today either. And that's exactly why I want to have that discussion as a Heritage Committee. Uh, Vice Chair Podolsky? Yes. Um, I think that it might be helpful to the uh, owner developer and uh, the consulting team to hear the straw vote comments from the committee because that's what you asked for. And I think that uh, I'm prepared to share that I draw your attention to uh, Sandy Smallwood's comments that the issue of uh, lot division remarkably is in the Heritage Conservation District study and in guidelines. It's not divorced from it. Uh, where we generally deal with generally something called context, uh, you know, the architecture and uh, the landscape. So the question of uh, lot division is very central to the heritage character of the Rockcliffe Heritage Conservation District and the points that uh, Sandy Smallwood made are very central to the application and uh, what the community adjustment will have to address in their own way, but not necessarily relating to the Heritage Conservation District guidelines. So 
as a way of shortcutting and giving you some sense of uh, what my views are on this. I would be supporting uh, a motion that Sandy Smallwood indicated that he would uh, put forward if we had to right now, namely to reject the application that would be on the grounds of the uh, uh, the uh, Heritage Conservation District guidelines on lot division, which are very clear, and also on the question of soft and hard landscaping. I think that uh, the presentations were not really forthcoming on the cutting of mature trees. And I think that um, by downplaying that, I think that didn't help the committee to really come to grips with that. So I would not be supporting the staff recommendation uh, should this come to a vote. And I think that might be helpful to you just to know that uh, uh, as you requested. Oh, sorry. I have a question, um, and I don't know which one of you. If the applicant uh, wished to um, just go with the permitted lot size and not have any variances, would it be possible for them to build these two houses on that? So they'd be just, ask, so they'd be just basically severing the lot without exceptions. Uh, Three, Madam Chair, I, do, I don't think it would be possible to sever this lot into two complying lots um, and not need any variances. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Council, hang it, because I because what we have before us right now is tabling it. I'm going to go to Councillor Clark. Uh, contrary to some of this, I do believe we have had a heritage discussion. In fact, we started out with a heritage discussion. This is within the Heritage Conservation District. And if you read the, the guidelines in the Heritage Conservation District, it does not meet them. If you read Heritage Ottawa's views, uh, it is not within the definition. Uh, clearly, you might say, well, I don't like this project because the aesthetics don't appeal to me, and that's that's a personal thing, so I can't vote on that basis, but I can vote on the basis of whether or not this meets the HCD requirements. And the other herring, we're into chickens and eggs and carts before horses, and now we're into red herrings, is the discussion around whether the Committee of Adjustment would be adversely impacted by a decision here and vice versa. They're kind of contiguous in real terms, that they're going to, you know, the Committee of Adjustment might, and I stress that word, uh, permit a severance. Uh, they've been known to do that. That shouldn't affect whether or not we agree that this meets the HCD requirements. And does the Committee of Adjustment have to take into account HCD requirements? I'm not sure about that either. Personally, I think we should reject this application on its face as not meeting the HCD requirements. Uh, tabling it and going through another bit of shenanigans is probably not going to change my view very much. And uh, I am not in favor of tabling it. I am in favor of dealing with it as not meeting the HCD requirements right here, right now. So, Ms. Santa, um, we really have two things. We can vote on the uh, staff recommendation, and if, if people are opposed to it, they can vote against it. Um, and we can table it, and what's necessary for tabling, a motion to table. And that, and that would, would like deferral, would that take precedent over the voting on the, if, we, if, if there was a deferral motion, that takes precedent over, so I would presume the tabling takes precedent over the, the uh, recommendation. Yes, Madam Chair, that's correct. Okay, so the other thing is, if the tabling doesn't pass, and then we have um, uh, the recommendation is defeated, 
then we would have a, a motion necessary that would uh, say that we reject the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the recommendation, and that would go forward. That's correct. The refusal of the recommendation would move forward. Okay. Is anyone interested in, in moving tabling? Nobody? You will? Member Quinn's going to move tabling. So on the issue of tabling, we'll have yeas and nays. So what that means, just in case we don't, we're not clear after all the conversation, that um, the applicant's going to agree to extend the 90-day period till the end of August, that this item will come back, be the first item on the agenda for the August the 14th, um, and then presumably we'll have a decision from the um, Committee of Adjustment. It'll go to planning on the 21st of August and it'll go to council on the 27th of August. That's the tabling. So yeas and nays on, on uh, Member Quinn's motion to table. Member Podolsky. Member Quinn. Member Quinn? No. Member Small? <coughs> so hang on a second. Yes. Can we have yeas and nays, Madam Chair? Thank that's, you. That's what I'm doing, but they're just not answering. Sorry. Use your mic, please. So we yes. have. Member Sir. Podolsky has said no to tabling. No. Member Quinn has said. Yes. Member Smallwood? No. Councillor Hobbs? No. Councillor Moffat? Yes. Councillor Clark? No. Chair? Yes. Three yeas, four nays. No. Other way around, isn't it? Three nays, four yeas. Three yeas, four nays. Three yeas. I mean, three nays, four yeas? Yes. So table is defeated, so now on the staff recommendation. Yeas and nays. She knows that. Councillor Moffat? No. Councillor uh, Member Quinn? No. Member Smallwood? No. Councillor Clark? No. Councillor Hobbs? Yes. Vice Chair Podolsky? No. Chair Harder? Yes. Two yeas, five nays. So the application is, the recommendation is not supported. Is there any recourse at all from this, Ms. Santa? Or does it just, does it? Does it, uh, does it still go to planning committee? It does, doesn't it? Yes, Madam Chair. The recommendation, uh, the refusal of the recommendation will move up to planning committee, uh, which will ultimately then council will make uh, a decision and this can be appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board. And it will go to, and it will go to planning committee on the 21st? I, I have to check my calendar, Madam Chair. That's I'll, the next plan. Well, yes. It won't go to the one in July. It will go one in July. You see, huh? Due to the 90 days, it has to go July 8th and July 9th to meet the 90-day requirement. Okay, so, so may I just put out there once again that that will be before they go back to the Committee of Adjustment. Anyway, thank you, um, and thank you for coming. Oh. We did have a technical amendment on the uh, on uh, the uh, old Prospect Road, and that was moved by Vice Chair Podolsky um, just to accept the new um, uh, revised document three to the 
aforementioned report. Yeah, so moved. Okay. Carry? Carry, everybody? Thank you. So now on to the horticulture presentation. I don't, I don't. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are we all ready? Okay. Um, this, uh, this is the designation of um, the redesignation of the horticulture building at Lansdowne Park. Uh, it's in front of you today because um, during the negotiations for uh, 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 about uh, Lansdowne Park, the property was de-designated under, um, under the Ontario Heritage Act, and a recommendation was passed by council that when it uh, when it was moved, which it has now been moved, that it be considered for redesignation under Part Four of the Ontario Heritage Act. This is the horticulture building. It was uh, constructed in 1914 on the grounds of the Central Canada Exhibition as a uh, horticulture building for displays. Also at the time it was designed to serve as a curling rink with rinks in the back, natural rinks in the back. So it was a dual purpose building from its construction. It was designed by Alan Kiefer who was a local Ottawa architect, uh, designed with many houses in Rockcliffe Park. Also he was a chief uh, assistant chief um, Dominion architect and uh, designed Ashbury College, um, the Ottawa Ladies College, which is a designated building, and worked on the rebuilding of the centre block after the fire uh, into the 1920s. The building itself is, uh, is an example of the prairie style of architecture. We actually have Kiefer's original drawings here. These are held uh, by the City of Ottawa. So it is an example of the prairie style of architecture, which was popularized by Frank Lloyd Wright in the early 20th century, um, pr primarily in the Chicago area. Um, and it influenced design throughout North America, and many architects also embraced the style. For many years, this building was attributed to Francis Sullivan, who was Ottawa's leading um, uh, prairie style architect, but uh, the recent documentation has shown that he did not design it. So Kiefer's name is on the drawings and in contract record, it was Kiefer who was noted as having done the su successful designs for this building. What, excuse me, <coughs> identifies it as a prairie style building is wide overhanging eaves, geometric patterned um, windows, uh, with a very distinctive pattern, minimal, minimal amounts of decoration, um, the flat roof, uh, and, uh, uh, and its low horizontal profile. Here is uh, a side view of the building. And uh, this is a recent uh, sketch by architect Julian Smith, who's been involved with the building, um, and its move and its repurposing on the uh, Lansdowne, as part of the Lansdowne Park development. So there's some of its history. There, and when it was constructed, there were a number of permanent structures on the, uh, at Lansdowne Park. And um, uh, there's only, uh, it says one, I meant two. Huh. It's one of the two remaining. Uh, prairie style, again, the features that are associated with that. Um, uh, so now for policy background, for designations, uh, the official plan, um, section 2.5.5, gives council uh, direction to designate significant properties under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. The Ontario Heritage Act has section uh, 29, which, uh, which is what uh, they use to designate, and there's regulations associated with that, 0906 uh, the re is the regulation uh, that says that a building, to, in order to be designated, a building should have a associated of historical value, design or physical value, or contextual value. This building, as an excellent example of the prairie style, meets the criteria for design value and for uh, being designed by a prominent architect that also meets the design value criteria. Historical value, as it was um, designed for horticultural displays and a curling club, uh, and it was significant as a permanent building and as a, a 
and speaks to the former use of Lansdowne Park as the exhibition grounds, which were very important in the development of Ottawa as they were in most large 19th century uh, Canadian uh, cities where uh, exhibitions were held. So that is... Um, uh, so our conclusion is that the department recommends the issuance of a notice of intention to designate under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act according to the statement of cultural heritage value. And I would like to draw your attention to a, uh, a document uh, that was circulated to you yesterday. Um, this, uh, the comments for Heritage Ottawa were received late and they had asked that some interior elements of the building uh, be, that weren't in the original uh, culture statement of cultural heritage value that I wrote be included. So in concert with um, Heritage Ottawa, I quickly crafted some um, uh, uh, heritage attributes associated with the interior of the building, and these are in front of you today. So I would ask that, um, that these be substituted for what was originally circulated. Um, and I can speak to those if anybody wants me to. Plus, I want to add that the building is also protected by a heritage easement held by the Ontario Heritage Trust. And, uh, and that was signed um, between, the, uh, between the city and the Heritage Trust. So everything that is mentioned in, um, or a, a lot of what is captured in the attributes is also captured in the heritage easement. So, uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We're very happy to have this come back into our inventory. And uh, if you remember the, uh, uh, the saga with the, uh, the mayor, actually, Mayor uh, Watson was a very strong uh, proponent of uh, saving this building and I remember the angst about it at the time and and the condition of it at the time and now um, it's got centuries left certainly not a derelict property anymore that's for sure and I think that uh, it'll have far more attention and presence for sure at our uh, rejuvenated Lansdowne Park so thank you very much um, Anyone have anything else to say? Another technical amendment. Moved by uh, Vice Chair Badalski. Yes, it's simply that, um, and I'll read it, uh, whereas Heritage Ottawa responded uh, late to have their comments incorporated into the report designation of the horticultural building Lansdowne Park under Part 4 of the Interior Heritage Act, and whereas Heritage Ottawa would like to have some interior elements of the building incorporated into the Statement of Cultural Heritage Value Document 6. Therefore, it be resolved that the subcommittee approve acceptance of the revised Document 6 to the aforementioned report. Is that carried? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, staff, for all your work today. Um, it's great we get another kick at the can at Green. At green. Um, When's that coming? Is that coming to the next meeting? Yep. Okay. Is that for sure? And we don't know for sure. Exactly. Okay. So we may or may not see that in August. So any notices of motion? Pardon? I said carried already. On this. On the horticulture. On the report is amended. Carried. Okay. Notices of motion for consideration? None. Any inquiries? Hang on, we might have missed something. What are we missing? Oh, yeah. I thought we did this already. This is your formal withdrawal of a motion that was previously given. And, uh, and we must have skipped a beat, and it's a longer time in between the last meeting and this one. Did you want to? It's therefore be resolved the Built Heritage Subcommittee directs that staff review the protocols and procedures in place for non designated properties listed on City's Heritage Register in order to determine a policy going forward with respect to situations arising. So we're, you're re agreeing to withdraw that. Did you have any comments on that, Mr. Uh, Chair, Vice Chair Podolsky? Uh, no, uh, Chair Harder, you were more eloquent than I am on the written words. Wonderful. <laughs> Do we have to vote on withdrawing it? No. Okay, perfect. 
Um, although I'll tell you that procedurally in the past, in since amalgamation, there was a time that somebody tried to withdraw and the rest of council didn't agree. And they put, they, they re put the motion forward and they voted on it. And the person, didn't, the person that actually had put forward the motion didn't, wasn't allowed to withdraw it. This wasn't on a heritage thing, but I remember it. So it's not like impossible. So any inquiries? No, and any other business? Um, except I'll just remind you of September, Natalie, what's her, Rose, what's her date? September 21st, is it? No, no, our, our tour, 22nd. September 22nd, we're having a tour, um, and we're asking the, uh, uh, and we'll have another one uh, next year, but we're, of the districts we're going to, we're asking the districts actually to be on the bus and tell us about their part of uh, heritage in the city of Ottawa. So we're looking forward to that. And we're adjourned. Okay. Next meeting is Thursday, uh, 14th of August. I'll see you then. Thank you. Natalie will, uh, we might as well walk with Natalie. She'll take, she'll go back over to my office. Unless you want to take a break. Do you want to take a break? We have water, I think, don't we? We have water. Okay.